Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership Through Crisis series, where we will connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important questions to help us navigate these rough waters. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask, go to masterleadership.org forward slash podcast. That's masterleadership.org forward slash podcast for more information. Today we are speaking with David Burkis. He believes you've got to look at leadership from a variety of angles, and that's what he spent his entire career doing. First as an aspiring writer studying leadership and organizational psychology in college and graduate school, then in industry as a member and leader of various teams in the pharmaceutical industry. And then an accidental twist led him to teach future leaders as a business school professor for the last decade. Today, David is one of the world's leading business thinkers. His forward-thinking ideas and best-selling books are changing how companies approach innovation, collaboration, and productivity. His TED Talk has been viewed over two million times. David's writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, USA Today, Fast Company, and more. He's been interviewed by NPR, the BBC, CNN, and CBS This Morning. Since 2017, David Burkis has been ranked as one of the world's top business thought leaders by Thinkers50. Welcome, David Burkis. How are you? I'm good, all things considered, in the midst of what we're recording this in. I'm good. I'm kind of itching to go outside and get a little more exercise. But other than that, I'm doing well. I think we all are. We're so happy to have you in our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Oh, I'm ready. Thank you for having me. All right. So, David, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. Yeah. So I have this very winding path, right? In fact, I I think of it more as like a circle or a labyrinth, right? So my story, man, I graduated undergrad from college and I wanted to be a writer even then, but I knew I wanted to about business topics and psychology topics and that sort of thing. So I went to work in marketing for a pharmaceutical company, worked my way through there, uh, leading a team, trying to get into sort of training and a bunch of stuff. I went to graduate school to learn a bit more about what I wanted to write about more than anything. If I got promoted because I had a master's degree, that'd be great too. Along the way, so here's the weird part of my story. I married a medical student or a, a girl I met actually in college who said she wanted to get married and wanted to go to medical school, which is sort of like gulp, okay. So when I finished my master's degree, I found that working full time and not having school meant that I was bored 20 to 30 hours a week while she was studying. What? <laughs> right? You so I, went and, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't handle boredom. So I started a doctoral program. I ended up getting a doctorate in strategic leadership, all while still working in that industry. A couple things happen along the way as I'm running different teams and running trainings and that sort of stuff. This thing in the United States called the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, passed. And I don't look, I don't, everybody has a different opinion on it, but one thing that's for certain is that it changed the pharmaceutical industry. And so I very quickly found myself looking for other work. And because of my uh, extra graduate work, I ended up most qualified to go in and I taught business school for another 10 years, right? So 10 years in industry, I just came out of 10 years of teaching in a business school full time. So training up future leaders, right? In MBA programs and that sort of thing. And now I'm super excited because where I wanted to be when I was an undergrad in college, is where I am now, where my full-time job now is I write books that help leaders. I run trainings and speaking and workshops that help leaders in the marketplace, um, which is great because I get to work from home. So the only thing that this whole coronavirus mess has added is that in addition to all of those leadership titles, I am also a vice principal of a elementary school that my eight-year-old and six-year-old attend in, in our house in our what? basement, right? So I guess no, that's are another- you serious? Are you serious? You well, were I'm not, not, no, 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 no. I, I joke, right? So <laughs> oh, that oh, I feel oh, like, I get, oh, I'm a little slow. I'm, I'm in charge of schooling them now for the rest of <laughs> this time, right? Um, I will tell you, we, we take it very seriously. So yeah, I'm vice principal. We okay. named our school. We refer to it as the Burke Academy. How do your kids take to that? 
Actually, I think they like me as a teacher more than my wife. Oh. Um, so I'm much more chill as a teacher. So we get these sheets every week from the school and it's do all of these different activities. And my wife is very, maybe it's the former med student who is very by the book. And I'm sort of like, oh, well, this worksheet has all sorts of equations on them. What if I just go grab some cans from the pantry and instead of two plus three, we just have two cans and three jars. I'm very much more that. So I think they like me better. <laughs> I could see how energetic. How old are your kids? They are eight and six. Full of energy, vim and vigor, and he's never bored. <laughs> so yes, that is the parent that you will gravitate to. <laughs> yeah. Except when you're a teenager. I come in and I said, Jordan, it's time to get up. I am your principal, your dean. I am your counselor. Yeah, That's see, like so you're, you're a principal too of a school, right? <laughs> we all are now. It's crazy. Right. Only he doesn't like it too much. <laughs> That's the difference. All right. So certainly this has affected many people. It's affected all of us in different levels. How has this pandemic and we're we're hopefully on the tail end of it i'm in new york where are you located i am in tulsa oklahoma we're slowly opening back up are you in the city i'm like 20 minutes from the city okay so. yeah my sister lives in jersey city in new jersey and so we're getting okay. updates from that and mm -hmm. that experience is three or four times the experience we went through. So, oh. you know, God love you all in the city. It's been crazy. It's been intense and we've been learning a lot. So I'm so, so interested in talking to you about what's going on. So tell me about your organization. How has this affected your organization? Yeah, so my organization is me and an assistant. I joke that I refer to her as my chief of staff, right? Because there's no other staff, but we are, you know, predominantly training, speaking, et cetera. And of course, everything that was in person for the entire spring is now either pushed to the fall or is online. The biggest adaptation to me is I didn't actually know there were this many video conferencing platforms to have to learn my way through. But I'll be honest, the second part of your question was around the family. All of those are sort of small time problems, right? These are easy solutions to solve. My wife finished medical school, ended up getting in a residency program and getting board certified in emergency medicine. So she's been on frontline, frontline. And I'll tell you that the thing that I've learned, and I started saying this even after the new book was written, but it aligns with it. I learned through that just how much your work affects every other aspect of your life. And, and here's what I mean by that. So basically we have this whole sanitation protocol now. She gets home from work. She drives a car. That's the only car she's in. That way she touches anything. If, if somebody else has to use it, we got to Lysol and wipe that whole car down. She comes in, luckily our house goes right into the laundry room, which is now off limits to everyone but her basically because that's where she changes clothes, runs into the shower, we sterilize all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's almost like watching you see in those outbreak movies, right? right where they right. go through that section of the chamber that sprays them down. We're, we're almost right. there. And here's what it made me realize though, is that we're doing this with this tiny little microscopic virus. And yet I think the same thing applies to people's work when it comes to other toxic things like negativity, like gossiping, like backbiting, suffering through poor leadership, having toxic coworkers, just like the risk of bringing this little molecule home, right, that she goes through every day, it's been this crazy visualization of the same stuff gets drug home from a terrible work environment too, which really, from what I do, just kind of fires me up even more to help leaders actually reduce that toxicity, actually increase alignment and motivation on their teams. Because we learned this when we all were tasked with either working from home or not working, we learned that there is no work-life balance, right? They're integrated together and they spill over to each other more often than we right. would like to admit. And that makes it all the more important to get that work piece right. Because if you don't, you're ruining more than just people's experience of work. You might be ruining their whole life. And I like that thought too of sending people to the mudroom. <laughs> if they have a bad attitude, go get adjusted. <laughs> and you speak truth, a little bit of negativity. And if someone brings that toxicity, it can really do some damage. Now, you mentioned your book. Tell us about your book and where we can get it. Yeah, so it's been a really fun experiment. It's been a really timely message, although a very not so timely format. And here's what I mean. So the book is called Pick a Fight. At the core is this idea that when it comes to mission and vision and purpose and all those things that we do to try and really motivate people, people don't necessarily want to join a company. They want to join a crusade, a cause, a revolution. They want a clear and concise answer to the question, what are you fighting for? And most mission statements do not provide that, right? Most of them are vague, flowery language, something about shareholder value, and then a series of other buzzwords, right? 
So what I found is the leaders that can cut through all of that and clearly and concisely explain to our people, this is the good in the world we are fighting to bring, or this is the evil in the world we are fighting against see much more alignment on mission and vision, but see much more motivation among their people. And there's even research that suggests that much more bonding and collaboration happen in these truly sort of teams that know what they're fighting for. We released it in partnership with Audible, the idea being leaders are busy people. I mean, it's why people love your podcasts, right? Because they listen to it while they're commuting to work uh, or they listen to it while they're doing something else. Little bit of a problem, right? In that right now, nobody's commuting to work. <laughs> What we found is people are sort of getting into their new rhythm. They're picking back up their audio trends and that sort of stuff. But I get asked all the time, wow, we're in the midst of this global crisis where we're all fighting this one enemy. Did you know this was coming because you wrote a book about how that can motivate people? And I always say no, because if I knew it was coming, I wouldn't have released it only in audiobook. <laughs> right. So we can get it on Audible? So you can get it on Audible, iTunes, anywhere you get audiobooks, even your library if you have like an overdrive or that sort of system. And then we're figuring out the contracts with how we can take it into ebook and print if we can, because we released it in partnership with Audible, partly because it's also pretty short. It's two hours and four minutes to listen to, right? Okay. So I had it deliberately arranged so that it would basically be two commutes, right? You go to work, you go back from work, you do it again on Tuesday, and boom, you finish the entire book. You got the idea. Then of course, everybody's okay. commute stopped. Right. But yeah, anywhere you get audiobooks, it is available. Perfect. So David, where can we connect with you? The best place to connect with me, probably the central location would be davidburkus.com. Really weird last name. Luckily, the URL was available. So B-U-R-K-U-S.com. And then from there, wherever you want to chat on whichever social we've got, I'm finding, I don't know, are you finding this? I'm finding that LinkedIn has become the place where like regular grownups talk now. I so that's it. definitely my I, preference. Yes, mine too. <laughs> Perfect. Now, what resources, quotes, or advice has helped you most during this crisis? So one of my intellectual heroes, another kind of pioneer thinker around leadership is a guy named Roger Martin. He was the dean of the Rotman School of Management at uh, University of Toronto. I mean, there actually wasn't a serious business school anywhere in Canada before he was tasked with starting one. And one of the core ideas that he has is this thing called integrative thinking. He wrote a book called The Opposable Mind, which is all about how the great leaders that really accomplish, we well, could call it a disruptive innovation or a new business model or whatever it is. Usually the trick that they all have is they took things that were seemingly in contrast, models that were seemingly opposed. Like for example, in strategy, there was always this idea that you had to be low cost or you had to be high value differentiated for a niche type of person, Right. Oh, except Target, of course, because Target is lower cost and still very high in design looks, et cetera. They found a way to sort of merge those together. That was his big argument is that the leaders that can craft this vision that takes those two mental models that seem to be in opposition and actually combine them. And I found myself going back to this often, right? Because I mean, basically what were all of us asked to do during this crisis? We were asked to kind of go work from home, go zoom into every call, go do all this stuff. And yet the smart people, the people that I really attached to, I feel like they're almost even more social, even though it's pixels instead of people, right? That are face to face with. I mean, within a week, I was getting invited to Zoom happy hours. And some people were organizing these whole virtual conferences that they weren't even planning on an in-person event. Like it's one thing to pivot and go, oh, we can't have our event. It's a whole other thing to go, we're staging this entire virtual event. We're selling tickets to raise money for healthcare workers. Like, it's amazing what people have done. And you would think, I mean, the idea of a lockdown to me sounds like nothing is getting done. And yet we're seeing this explosion of creativity, of social activity, et cetera. So that has me going back to Roger Martin and this idea of integrative thinking, because it's clear, like what I thought was going to be basically this dead time, this like mini dark ages in 2020 has turned into this amazing creative flourishing. It's been amazing to watch. And it, it makes me, again, go back to all of his work and think through how I can do something similar. Hey leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. If you want to find, claim, develop, and expand your voice in order to land that job, those clients, or that partner, then Master Your Swag podcast is for you. You don't have to have expert credentials to be featured, and you can select from several plans that can perfectly match your needs. Go to MasterYourSwag.com and claim your spot as a guest and be ready to get noticed. Your area strategic leadership. 
Mm -hmm. And I've never experienced this in my lifetime. I'm sure you haven't. So what are you learning right now? I'm learning two things, right? And both of them are reaffirmations of lessons that I think too often we just get busy and fall by the wayside, right? The first is that humans are fundamentally social, right? Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you need human connection. And the leaders that are the best leaders are the ones, I mean, Tom Peters said this 40 years ago with management by walking around, right? That established that personal connection. There are some leaders that are running their team calls for work, et cetera, that are just very stick to business. And then there are others that are, hey, how are you doing? We can, we'll handle that other stuff first, but let's actually check in and let's connect. And you can guess which teams have actually thrived in the last six weeks, right? It's reaffirming that idea and then reaffirming, quite frankly, the idea that I ended up writing about in Pick a Fight, which is this idea that when we as the people, we are very inherently social creatures. And when we feel that we're threatened by that, right? What we call in the management literature, pro-social motivation, bonding, acting in the best interest of other people actually goes up. We see this every natural disaster. America hasn't had something like this since at least 1957 in terms of a pandemic. But every time there's a flood, every time there's any kind of hurricane or tornado or something like that, we see increases in pro-social motivation. Again, the idea behind Pick a Fight, I was sort of dealing with abstractions in terms of a business landscape and all that sort of stuff, and then got this front row seat into this one. At the same time, I remember six weeks ago when people were saying, oh, you know, if you don't own a gun, you should go buy a gun. I mean, terrible idea, first of all, because if you don't know anything about them, you shouldn't own one. But everybody was predicting, like, there's going to be looting and there's going to be riots. And instead, what we have is like, no, there's going to be 19-year-olds who are healthy knocking on the door of their elderly neighbors going, I'm going to the store. Can I get you anything? Because I know it's dangerous for you to go outside right now. That's a totally different thing. But it's in line with the research. Humans are always always more pro-social when they as a group feel that threat. And so it's been, again, kind of tragic to see that it takes a threat to do that. I wish we could find a way to do it all the time. But it's encouraging because we always predict this sort of breakdown of society when these things happen, and they almost never break down. Instead, society bonds closer together. I think of this a lot, language. And we're talking about social distancing all the time, and that's the language that we've embraced. Yeah. Personally, I prefer the term physical distancing. But do you think this will affect us down the road if we continue to use this language? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I've tried to do the same thing. I ended up stumbling on social while distant because this idea that we're still social, we still gather, we just happen to be physically located against each other. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't know why it was in the literature as socially distant. And then we all got trendy. And unfortunately, it's the term that they use. And now there are stickers on the ground. I was literally at the store today and there are stickers that six feet apart while you're waiting in line to check out and pay for your groceries. And they all say, observe social distancing. I mean, the weird thing is we don't even necessarily need a term for this, right? We could even just say, be mindful of others and then have the stickers out there. Or like you said, be physically distant, but socially connected. On the one hand, I'm with you. I think that it creates an interesting dynamic that people think, what I'm worried about is when we start opening up, how long it's going to be before people feel like they have permission to organize things, but I'm grateful that there are still people that are smart enough to know that we can organize things virtually. And we can also organize, my wife has done this several times with people. And remember, she's an ER doctor, so people should be running from her like she has the plague. (laughs) But she's organized, you know, let's all go for a walk, meaning let's all go for three walks six feet apart. That's still a talkable distance to each other. We can still actually communicate and be outside and get some fresh air and that sort of stuff. And so I think you're right. I think that language has an effect. I'm grateful for the people that, like yourself, that aren't allowing that to happen or are thinking of ways to be social while distant because we as humans crave that social connection. We are always doing it. The book Before Pick a Fight was called Friend of a Friend and it was about how social networks work and no one works in isolation. Everybody is connected to some amount of network that provides them bonding capital, that provides them, uh, which is a fancy schmancy term for you know the ability to feel cared for, connected to, and there are correlations between how much you have of that and things like how long you live, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a little worried about this term, but I'm really grateful for the people that are using their own language, like yourself, or are going like, forget this, let's just do this virtually while we can, because that social connection piece is huge for all of our lives and our leadership. Great. And, you know, speaking of language, the title of your book is Pick a Fight. Why did you choose that title? (laughs) I like it. Yeah. I mean, it's deliberately provocative, isn't it? So two reasons. And I've gotten some resistance on use of the word fight. But here's why I couldn't think of, and I'm a writer, thinking of words is usually not a problem, but I couldn't think of any other word that would capture the idea that it's not enough to have a cause you're working for. What really bonds and motivates people is that there are also stakes 
to not achieving that. There are stakes to losing, right? And when you think about that, I mean, fight is probably the only word that comes to mind. But I need to stress here that I didn't choose the term fight because I don't think it's about a fight between two competitive companies. That almost never motivates people. So I realize I'm butting against this language that was popular in the 1980s and 1990s and the greed is good era of Wall Street, et cetera, of all of this competitiveness. Turns out a lot of that backfires. So to be totally honest, that's the reason it's called pick a fight, right? Because you gotta pick a fight. You gotta choose something worth fighting for, but you have to choose your fight wisely. Not every fight will actually motivate people. And the rival fight, the one against where you pick the certain competitor, turns out to not motivate all that many people. People want to be working for some bigger cause, but that cause has to have stakes as well. And so I kept coming back to the F word, if you will. I kept coming back to fight. <laughs> so it's kind of like pick the hill on which you will die on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I hope you don't die. Exactly. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, we're working for a more connected world. Well, yes, okay. but are there stakes to that? What are you working against in doing that? What happens if we don't succeed, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of times we don't think about that enough when we try and write the fanciest mission statement ever. And it turns out that, that what happens if you don't succeed motivates a whole lot more people to put their butts in gear than does the flowery aspirational vision side. And so the best way to combine the two is a fight. Love it. All right. So David, when you think of leadership today, what mm -hmm. most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? So we already sort of talked about this idea that people are more pro-social. That's the part that gives me hope, right? That as we're faced with these threatening things, whether it's a natural disaster or a pandemic, we cling to each other and we bond more. But that's also what gets me worried because we're coming out of this, right? We're mm -hmm. starting to open back up. Some states are opening back up now. Some countries are sending their kids back to school soon. And when companies start to do that and people stop working from home with this idea of there's a purpose behind it because we're flattening the curve, what are leaders going to do? Are we going to go back to that old fight against the competitor rhetoric? I mean, we've seen just how meaningful this larger purpose is because we've all been fighting the same thing for the last six to eight weeks. Are we gonna go back to business as usual or are we gonna find that sort of new purpose? We look at all of these other global crises that we could be working on. This one got our attention real fast because of the dire nature of it. I hope we can pivot some of that attention back to some of these other problems, even if they seem to be less pressing problems. I hope we can pivot back. Whether or not we do, that's what concerns me in the future. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, I have a question from Dr. Amir Rashidian, who is an amazing chiropractor and a guest on our show. And he wants to know, what are you doing to show love and appreciation and gratitude to those who are doing so much during this time? Well, I guess I help with my wife every single day, right? But, right, right. <laughs> but we're quite clearly having a disproportionate, I don't want to call it level of suffering, but level of effort, right? We all know the healthcare workers. And then we sort of joke, I mean, myself, like I joke that I'm the vice principal of a school, et cetera. But in reality, this thing hasn't transformed my day-to-day -day of life as much as it has somebody who is locked in a nursing home and will be for a number of months or somebody who lost their job because of the economic slowdown that we needed to have in order to slow down the virus. So I've been trying to search my community, my network and find out who those people are and make a note to increase my frequency of communication with them. It started by basically committing to every day I send one to two. It's literally a five word text message called how you holding up. That's all I send five words. Okay. I used to do it because I make a regular point of checking back in with what in fancy network science terms are called your dormant ties, the people that you haven't talked to in a while, because there's all sorts of opportunities to learn, connect, get potential introductions from those people. So there's a wealth of value in them and a wealth of value you provide when you reconnect with them. But right now, my bigger question is just that, how are you holding up? And then I'm trying to make a mental note of the people that I know have a lot more being asked of them than most of us. And healthcare workers are part of that. But like I said, there's a lot of people that we're not seeing, we're not thinking about. The people who had their ability to create an income at all just disappeared for right now. How are you holding up? How can I help? I'm trying to find those sort of hidden or dare I say forgotten people because I think those are the ones that are especially now going to need to know that there are people that care for them, but are also going to need people to come alongside them right when we open back up to get whatever they're going through past them as quickly as possible. And something to look forward to as well is that this show of love, appreciation, and gratitude continues even after this. So that's a good thing to look forward to. Yeah. Now, as a listener of this podcast, what is a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? 
Ooh, I like this. One of my favorite questions to ask people is, what do you believe that most people don't? Or the flip side of that is sort of, what have you changed your mind about in the last eight weeks or so? And I think all of us have changed our mind about something since January 1, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there's also this idea that what do you believe that most people don't that's counterintuitive, that goes against the grain? Because I think there's a lot of potential to tap into people's motivations on that. I mean, candidly, that's one of the things at the core of Pick a Fight is this idea that the best fights are the ones that say society says this is acceptable and we refuse to accept that. So one of the things I try and get at in that sense of values is that question. What do you believe that you feel like most people don't? Love it. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? So I guess what I really want to do is reemphasize this visual picture that I was talking about earlier of my wife basically disinfecting, coming home from the hospital after shifts and having to disinfect this whole thing. But I think each of us need to have that same visual process when we go to work. Are you going into an environment that is infected with toxicity, with negative leadership, not A, what are you doing to solve that? But B, if you can't solve it, have you created a rhythm to kind of break out of that as well, to make sure that you are not dragging that stuff home with you? If you're getting drugged down or having some of that toxicity splashed on you at work, what are you doing to protect the people you love that you see after work, to protect them from running into it, right? Again, this is a core thing we ask of our leaders is first to make the environment less toxic, but also to find ways. Sometimes the best leaders are the ones that are just human shields that help protect the people, protect the people that they've been charged with taking care of, protect them from that toxicity, right? This virus is not the only source of negativity that a lot of us bring home from work every day. So find out what is yours if it exists, and then how are you taking steps to disinfect that from your life? And then, I mean, take that can of Lysol back to work. Start disinfecting and making (laughs) your work less toxic too. Absolutely, I love it. David, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day and stay safe. Awesome. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.